Victor Daysick. He is a research physicist and adjunct professor at UCLA. He's been involved in using and developing particle and cell, or, or everybody calls PIC. Yeah. Like, uh, everybody knows what we mean when we say PIC. His entire career, beginning as a graduate student under John Dawson, one of the pioneers of the technique. He's been active in parallel computing since 1987. That was right at the very beginning, wasn't it? Uh, Hypercubes. <laughs> He was the principal architect of the UPIC framework, which provides high accuracy and high performance spectral components for building new parallel PIC codes. He's currently developing PIC algorithms for emerging computer architectures, such as GPUs. In addition to numerous awards and honors, Victor received the John Dawson Award for pioneering advances to plasma physics, obtained through simulation from the International Conference on Numerical Simulations of Plasma in 2009. So as a longtime user of NERSC and HPC, Victor has seen it all pretty much, and he's going to offer his perspective in this talk. So, welcome, Victor. Uh, here's a pointer. Excuse me, here's a pointer. All right. So, th this talk is really about programming uh, and uh, recognizing that a lot of what looks like new has actually been around before. <laughs> but what I'm going to talk about in terms of programming specifically, or PIC codes, that's kind of what I do. Uh, so for those of you who aren't into plasma physics, I'll just <coughs> say what this is. So PIC codes integrate the trajectories of many particles interacting uh, self-consistently via their electromagnetic field. So they model plasmas at the most fundamental and microscopic level. Uh, they're widely used in all areas of plasma physics, including fusion energy uh, that we heard about yesterday. Uh, plasma accelerators that we also heard about yesterday, and uh, many other areas. <laughs> they are the most complete, uh, but most expensive model. Uh, they are used largely when uh, continuum models fail, uh, like MHD, uh, and you need uh, some kinetic physics. Or they're often used nowadays to, as a test bed to, to verify a, uh, a more simple model that has thrown away some physics, but you're not sure if it threw away the right physics. So, uh, so, the, so these simple models are often very fast, <coughs> but you have to be careful on, uh, on their use. So PIC codes then give you a test bed to, to verify that the more complete codes do. So the largest calculation nowadays is about 3 trillion interacting particles. Uh, so they've gotten very big. So I've been around a while. I've been using supercomputers, in quotes, for about 40 years, starting with the IBM 36091 at UCLA in 1973, which is the year John Dawson arrived from Princeton. Uh, at that, in 75, the performance of my 2D PIC code, which I used in my thesis, was 99 microseconds per particle per time step. So that's kind of a, a starting point. The cost was astronomical, 30 cents per time step. So this actually was printed in the bottom of the output as to what this cost. And th this was a typical overnight run, cost the same as my monthly salary as a teaching assistant. <laughs> so this scared the hell out of me because <laughs> I was so afraid of making bugs <laughs> and, and spending so much money. I was terrified all the time. Uh, the first machine I used at NERSC, which was then MFECC, was the A machine, a, a different A machine than another A machine that came later, which was a CDC 7600. Uh, one interesting feature designed by Seymour Craig before he had frame machines. The A machine had an interesting feature in that it had a memory hierarchy. There was a small core that was fast and a large core that was slow, and you, the user managed that himself. Okay. Well, what's interesting is you see the same stuff on GPU. So, this <laughs> so, so you say, oh, this looks very familiar. On the A machine, my code gave a performance that was slightly worse than that, although the peak speed of this machine was, was, was higher, about twice what the IBM was. But the results were similar. So this is kind of the starting point of my career. So during this time, I have experienced uh, uh, two revolutions in, in supercomputing. And the first was the introduction of vector computing, which came in the, in the, eight, in the late 70s, early 80s. And we all had to learn how to vectorize our code. And that, uh, we had these uh, nice little crays. And uh, actually, I tried to get a picture of a cray from MF, from NERSC off the web, but I couldn't get it off the web. So <laughs> I had to get another one. 
the, uh, anyway, 1984, the performance of my code was about eight microseconds per particle per time step. Uh, I also went to Japan and used uh, Fujitsu, which was actually even better, uh, and it was a performance of about an order of magnitude from what we had. So vectorization was, was cool. Uh, but because vectorization is made comeback, let me go talk a little bit about that in more detail. So one place vectorizer, vector code appears is in field solver because it's usually a fairly straightforward and regular problem compared to thick where particles are going all over the place. <clears throat> so vectorizable means that the elements of a, of a vector can be processed in any order. So that's also the definition of what's parallelizable. Uh, and another feature that was important on Craze was that stride one memory access was, uh, was optimal. So in other words, if the, if the memories of each adjacent vector were stored next to one another, that was the best thing you could have. So, and that was primarily to avoid bank conflicts. So the memories were organized into banks. There was no cache here. And uh, if the worst thing would be, there were, I don't know, there were something like 64 banks or something. And the worst case was if you had a stride of 64, because you'd hit the same memory bank all the time. And uh, so you didn't want to do that. But anyway, here's a, a, actually a code from uh, similar to what I had in those days. And this is a field solver. It's actually solving Poisson's equation in Fourier space. And here, this is the inner loop uh, over my y coordinate. And uh, if, you, if I just, and with, if I just uh, put this in the compiler, it wouldn't vectorize it. It would say that there was a vector dependency in there. And that vector dependency was really coming from here because it, I'm doing both positive and negative Fourier modes at the same time. And the compiler couldn't tell that this these values might not overlap with the case, so that these two actually might be in the same location. So it wouldn't do that. But the fix was easy. You put a little compiler direction, which was ignore vector dependency, and it would say, OK, I can go. And so it would do that. So it was, so if code were uh, written like that, it was quite straightforward. And if you're an old timer with lots of code like that, you're going to love GPUs. Because <laughs> that's really pretty straightforward. Uh, the second revolution uh, that I had to deal with was the introduction of these distributed memory machines. And we had to learn how to parallelize our code with message passing. So I actually had an early start on this because I worked at, at uh, JPL and Caltech with the very early hypercubes in, in the, around 1986 or so. And Jeffrey Fox was one of the first people who built the first cosmic cube, which was a bunch of IBM PCs uh, connected. Uh, somewhat years later, then, we had uh, uh, NERSC got their T3E. They had a T3D earlier than that that we used that was, I don't know, I guess a loner or something. Or, uh, anyway, so the speed of the code then now went up to 13 nanoseconds per particle per time step. So that's uh, nearly a, a factor of 500 over what we had in the early uh, Cray days. On the other hand, the Mac on my desktop was running at 2.4 microseconds. So the uh, conclusion is that the desktop machine became equal to the supercomputer about 10 years later, so <laughs> more or less. Uh, not, not only that, but 3D now became practical. Before this, it was really very difficult to do 3D. There wasn't enough memory. Uh, and so we, we, the 3D code was running around 74 nanoseconds. And we used this machine for uh, the numerical tokamak project back in the, uh, around 1994 or so. Uh, I think originally with uh, the T3D and, and the MPI wasn't even existing then. It was still using PDM for the message passing and so on. But eventually things got standardized and it took a while. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how a few slides of how this was done because it's going to come back to haunt us here. <laughs> so one of the ways, the thing is that we're using distributed memory. So that means the, the, the processors don't share any, many, any memory whatsoever. And so we, what we do is we partition the, the space among processors. And so this is called domain decomposition. And here we are, uh, there's like six particles in this, uh, this processor and then there's six in each of them. So we, we find a partition such that each processor has the same number of particles. 
And you can, and you can calculate those partitions by just doing a, a running sum or a prefix scan in parallel, which you can do in parallel, and that tells you where the boundaries are. And in 2D or 3D, you just do it again. So you, you first do it in one coordinate and then the prefix scan in the other, and you can find where these partitions are. And we had a particle manager responsible for moving particles. So when the particle got to the edge of the region and moved into this region, there was some piece of software that would make sure it moved that, checked it, and moved that particle over to that, to that processor. So th this worked uh, really well. We, I mean, this is the scheme that people basically use today. And, and uh, uh, for, for the very largest uh, calculations, it scales to, you know, hundreds of thousands of processes, actually a million nowadays. Uh, the other thing that we did that, uh, was that we, uh, we use what sometimes computer scientists call a kind of a bulk synchronous model. So we don't overlap communication and, and computation for a couple of reasons. One, there wasn't very little to gain because it was, the overlap occurred at the edges, which didn't really have a big impact. And secondly, it really messed up the modularity of the code. It made it very difficult to, <coughs> to do that. But, and, it, uh, and it also turned out that there were really only kind of four communication patterns that we really needed for the most part in the code. So that made it much easier than you might imagine when you, I mean, computer scientists all complain about this is assembly language of parallel computing, but, and, and maybe it is, but, but there isn't much of it. <laughs> Or, or at least if it's well designed. So we had a particle manager, which is one subroutine. Uh, there was a field manager that took care of the edges. I had a couple of subroutines. Uh, one thing, uh, we had a partition manager because actually we often would change partitions. Uh, if it's a spectral code, we would change to a uniform partition for the FFT. Uh, otherwise, we might move partitions just for dynamic load balancing. Uh, there's also uh, the FFT used the transpose. So those are the primary communication patterns that we just we used over and over again. Uh, okay, so just one last thing to kind of show you some real code here. So this is uh, from uh, uh, the, the particle manager uh, using MPI. And basically, particles which leave the domain are buffered, and then they're sent and received to neighboring processes. So, so this is the send buffer. Some piece of code has gone through the particle list to see who doesn't belong here. It buffers them in, into here. And then the, this data is sent and, and the data is received. And there's two buffers, one going left and one right. And if it's uh, multi-dimension, then there's an outer loop that does up and down and with, in, in and out with the same subroutine. So you, you, you send these messages. And uh, when they arrive, these are asynchronous. When you arrive, you can find out how many particles got there from this get count. And, uh, and that was, you know, more or less the guts of, of, of this thing. So you buffer the particles, send them, receive them, and then this, when the receive buffer gets unpacked and inserted into the particle array. Uh, one really fun bug was uh, leaving this thing out. This is waiting for the send to go. And, you don't really, you know from other reasons the send was, was a sent, so you, you kind of think we might leave this out because we don't need to wait. We already know it's gone. That's a bad mistake. And it leads to a really nasty bug where the code will run for 100,000 time steps and crash. <laughs> and the reason is this actually has a side effect. It releases the buffers that were allocated here. And if you didn't release them, you were toast. That's a very hard bug to find. <laughs> Because it happened, you know, 100,000 time steps later. <laughs> okay. So another al type of algorithm that's used in, in, in these, these parallel machines was, was blocking or tiling. And, and the reason is that they now typically use risk processors. They had caches. The praise didn't have caches. So, uh, and the idea basically is you want to process data in small chunks, which, you know, fit into the, uh, the, the fastest memory that you have. So you put it in a fast memory, calculate, and go, to, go do the next chunk. It's also useful for uh, memory management. One of the things that is important to think about as we get to higher and higher you know, performance machines is that memory becomes a real, even more and more of a bottleneck. You have to pay more attention. 
So one thing that uh, uh, we sometimes use is we'll, we'll transpose the data. So this data here is in Fortran. Uh, the inner loop is the first one, and data stores, uh, Fortran stores data so that the inner loop is the fastest. So this loop has, is reading uh, the, the F data with stride one. So that's optimal. Every location that it's reading is, <coughs> is next to one another. So this gets the best bandwidth. This guy, however, is terrible because uh, he's got a big stride, namely NY, and especially uh, that means that, uh, so you'd think that wouldn't matter so much on risk process. I mean, on a prey, that was a disaster. Here, it's, it's not quite so bad, but the reason it, it, it's important is because these systems bring data in, in it with a cache line. So they're not just bringing in one piece of data, they bring in a whole cache line. And if the data is adjacent, you get all the rest of the data for free. <laughs> if the data is not adjacent, then you get in the whole ca cache line and you throw away most of it. And then you get to do it again. So, the, so there could be a substantial hit uh, with uh, reading data with that stride. So if you have an algorithm like an FFT, where you first work on one uh, coordinate for a long time, like log end loop, and then the other one, then you're better off transposing the data so that you get good strides here. And a fast way to transpose, then, is to use this sort of blocking, the tiling algorithm. So what you do is you break up this into a in a four-way loop, and you copy into a small buffer, which is typically smaller than the L1 cache or the L2 cache, whatever cache you're worried about, and you read this data with optimal stride into this buffer. And now you flip J and K, and you write it with optimal stride too. The buffer has bad stride, but he's really fast, right? Because this memory is really fast. So this way, you get almost, you get stride one coming in, stride one going out, and there's a little bad stuff here, but it's, you know, uh, fast memory. So, so this, is, this, this is used in like matrix transpose, libraries use this, uh, so there's lots of uh, algorithms, many of them are hidden from you users because they're in some library that you didn't know that they're there. Um, okay, all right, so now I think we're in a, how, how's my time, okay, we're good. So now I believe we're in the middle of a third revolution uh, in both hardware and software. And this revolution is driven by a number of things. Uh, increased memory parallelism, you know, Moore's law with frequency is sort of gone, but Moore's law as in, with lots of transistors is going strong, uh, but now it's, it's done with increased parallelism. Uh, we have a requirement for low power computing, and part of this revolution is driven by that. And, uh, and at least my goal is, is exaflop computing. Um, that's one of my goals. The other is to, you know, empower, you know, anybody, to, uh, less ordinary people who don't have access to nurse to do really cool stuff too. Okay, so two leading contenders uh, are NVIDIA GPUs and this Intel Pi, which is related to Knight's Corner, perhaps formerly known as. Uh, this one has a bit of a jump. Uh, a start, so I'm going to start with that one because it kind of came first. So GPUs are graphical processing units originally uh, invented for graphics, for gaming actually. It, they became programmable in 2007. People have told me that they didn't do this for the scientists, that they did it because the gaming people wanted to control special effects themselves, that the hardware wasn't fast enough in providing. So they didn't perhaps do it for us, but and then nonetheless, we can take advantage of it. So the GPU consists of about, at least the high end, you know, 12 to 30 SIMD multiprocessors. So SIMD stands for single instruction multiple data, which means it's using the same instruction on a whole bunch of numbers, not just one. So in particular here, on these machines, it's like eight or 32 numbers at the simultaneously. And they are being done in lockstep. And, and one reason this is important is it's, it takes much less energy to do 32 identical things than it does to do 32 separate things, right? So it's very energy conserving to have this kind of processor. But these are essentially vectors. I mean, they're, they're like we, we saw on the craze. They're, the hardware-wise, they're not the same. Vector the craze were really pipelined architectures, but from a software perspective, we could care less. They look the same to, to the software. 
So they have these multiple vector processors with a small fast memory, typically 16 to 48 kilobytes. And they have and the vector lengths are, and they have also a, a slow uh, global memory. Now this slow should be in parentheses because it's about an order of magnitude faster than the memory on your desk, on your mainframe, <laughs> on your host machine. So it's still pretty fast. Uh, that's readable by everybody. But one a unique thing about NVIDIA in particular, it has very fast lightweight threads that, that you can, they can switch out in one clock period. So they use this feature in a number of ways. One of them is to handle uh, I'll talk about that a little later, but they, so they have very high bandwidth. Now it's, you know, 100 to 200 gigabytes per second, but only if the access is ordered. In other words, they're bringing in a cache line. <laughs> so you've got to take advantage of that. Secondly, it can handle thousands of threads simultaneously. And so you can use this to uh, essentially optimize uh, uh, the memory access. So in effect, what happens is you have, suppose you're going to read Suppose it takes 200, you know, clocks to read memory. You can actually have 200 threads lined up one or another. You read one, one clock period, you go to the next thread, it read it, go to the next thread, and you basically pipeline memory uh, this way. So it's a way where you can almost complete, you know, if you have enough threads, you can actually hide the, the memory access. So the Intel MIC is actually very similar. It was only introduced in 2012, although Mike's Corner was around earlier but this is now a commercial product. So they have 50 to 60 processing units, so twice what some, some, the video I was using, uh, but the vector length is smaller. So uh, and they do have uh, uh, caches. They have also high bandwidth, in fact, higher than the NVIDIA, 300 gigabytes. Uh, and, and, uh, but they can only handle four threads per so they, 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 can't, they, don't, they can't handle as many threads outstanding as, as the NVIDIA. So they're similar but different. So basically what I'm arguing is that, uh, that, that these ma machines are all similar enough that we can program to sort of an abstract model of what these machines are and not worry about the actual hardware. So this is my abstract uh, figure. So a node consists of a bunch of vector processors. They have fast memory that they have only have access to within themselves. Uh, but they are connected through a slower global memory. And then we could, uh, in fact, connect them with MPI uh, that way as well. So, so this vector unit works in lockstep. It has local synchronization. So th uh, there is no global synchronization on, on this hardware, although AMD GPUs do all right. Uh, and uh, so, so, so we, so basically within one of these nodes, there's two levels of parallelism that you have to program to. One is this vector, and the other is the fact that you've got a bunch of these running simultaneously in parallel. So, uh, but it's the, the, the NVIDIA, the GPU we're using has 500 cores. Some of the newer ones have more. So each of these nodes is already a very powerful computer all by itself. And a supercomputer would then be a hierarchy of such powerful computers. There's a, a language called OpenCL that employs this abstract model within the language. I don't personally like this language, so I don't use it, but I, I like the model. <laughs> so I basically program to this model, but I don't necessarily need the languages that they provide. In fact, the different vendors have different ways of programming it anyway. So, uh, so this model applies to a wide variety of processors. So NVIDIA GPU is one, the vector length, which is, we're, this is actually a virtual vector length, something they call a block size. So it, it doesn't, it could be larger than the hardware. So it's, it's like a, they, they might treat 128 uh, together, even though the hardware might only have 32. Uh, but, uh, so, the block size can be even bigger than that, but usually 20, 128 is typically a good number. Number of vector processors is about like that. There's a the fast shared memory I showed is about this size. Intel Phi is similar. Vector length is half. Number of processors is twice. The cache L1 is about the same as here. Uh, but a traditional multi-core processor, say your laptop, has these vector SSE units. 
Uh, you probably don't even know what's in there. Uh, they have a vector length of four, and depending on how many of these processors you have, you might have, a, you know, four to 16, not on your laptop probably, but, but on the host machine, there might be four, 16 of them. We often don't program these explicitly, but they're there, and they also have the same stuff. And actually, even the Cray XMP back in the day had a vector length of 64 and two to four vector processors, but no, no fast shared memory. Uh, so it, it's a very general model, and, and that's what we're going to program for. So, but the other sort of fairly good news is although, so this model has a lot of stuff we're very familiar with. This is not, the pieces themselves are put together in a different way, but all the pieces are something we know. This thing here, we have vector algorithms. You can, as I said, a calculation of elements who can be done in any order. We have a lot of history on the Cray. Much of this has been forgotten because younger people come along, but there's some old fogies who still remember, but they're going to relearn. <laughs> the blocking tile algorithm that came out, with, you know, kind of once cache got introduced into these processors, then uh, these algorithms are, are well known. Uh, and, uh, and then domain decomposition, partitioning memory, so the different threads. So this, this SIMD, you know, this guy doesn't know about, this guy doesn't know about his memory, uh, and, uh, so uh, we have a long history with MPI uh, with that kind of code. So all the pieces are actually familiar, uh, but they're put together in a new way. Uh, so one way is that there's really two levels of parallelism involved right from the get-go. So there's a vector level and a parallel level that really are programmed together. And our earlier languages didn't support that kind of, kind of ability, but the new languages are coming do. The CUDA, OpenCL, OpenACC, all have the ability to handle two levels of parallel. Uh, OpenMP, uh, NVIDIA, uh, sorry, Intel is adding vector directives to their version of OpenMP, and it will probably eventually also become in the standard. Uh, but the other thing that's really surprising, and this, this really blew my mind away, <laughs> is that GPUs really require you to use many more threads than physical processors. And, you, and for somebody who's programmed MPI and Vector, you say, what? Or, or OpenMP, why would you want to do that? Because I mean, you would never do that with OpenMP. You wouldn't have more OpenMP threads than you have uh, processors or MPI nodes. Well, it, it has two really important reasons. One is it, do, it does hide memory latency. It allows you to pipeline memory. Uh, in a, and that's uh, important. But the other one, even more unexpected, was you can use a master-slave model for automatic load balancing, right? So you have, suppose you have one core and a hundred threads of little sub pieces of work to do. So some take more, some take less. In the old days with open M with MPI, you'd have to worry about where to put the domain to make sure they all work. But here you just, you know, one guy finishes early, he gets some more work. One guy finishes late, he doesn't. And eventually, it all kind of statistically balances out. So this is, this is well known as a kind of master-slave model, but uh, we, we never uh, thought of that. And so, so now, actually, NVIDIA has a certain amount of load, automatic load balancing built into their hardware. So it will actually, as these blocks finish, we'll find a, a free block. And recently, they're even adding the ability to go to give work from one multiprocessor to another so that uh, you have even more. But you can also do it manually. I mean, if you know your own code, you, you can manage this kind of stuff uh, yourself. Not on, you wouldn't do it on the GPU, but suppose you were writing in another language. So the other thing that, so this, this was a real surprise to me because, so if you'd asked me a couple years ago, you know, are you gonna use a billion threads in a PIC code? I said, you're nuts, there's no way you can do that. But now I can see why you could do that, actually. By having these micro parallel things, you have a lot of flexibility about who does what. So that, I did, that was unanticipated to me, and a new feature. So the other thing that's optimizing data movement is even more critical than it was before. It's always was important, and now it's really dead critical <laughs> that you've got to do this. Uh, so, so let's look a little bit about some of these. How am I doing? Uh, Algorithms, so here's the, the vector solver that I had before. This is from the GPU code. You can see there's only three lines of code that changed. 
right? So the one is that the loop index, this used to be a do loop, is now essentially this thing, and this is essentially analogous to the, the your node number in MPI. Everybody says, what's my node number? Okay, except the node number is two-dimensional in, in CUDA, but, uh, but that's basically your node ID. Uh, and then uh, because the number of threads actually running may not be an exact multiple of, of the loop that you're executing, you, you put the zip test to, to prevent you from sort of to deactivate the threads that aren't doing anything useful. So it's really easy. So like I say, if you have a lot of dusty code from the Cray, you're going to love the GPU. The, uh, here's a, a blocking tiling algorithm. So this is uh, used in the transpose. Uh, the transpose on, on CUDA is even worse than uh, because it's reading data in big blocks, even bigger than the cache line. Uh, the, the penalty for reading with a bad stride is, is quite large. So, uh, so doing transpose, if you're going to repeatedly, you know, access data in that way is even more critical. So here's the original Fortran. Uh, this is CUDA Fortran. By the way, you can do CUDA with Fortran. And uh, so you have a shared memory, which you allocate, and you declare this, uh, this, scrap, this temporary memory. And here's the loop index. Uh, now become these thread IDs. You copy this. There's just a, you know the if statement replaces the. I should have black put that in black. Beca because many threads are working, you have to have a synchronization point because you don't want to be. Not everybody is writing this at the same time, so you want to make sure that you don't start uh, you know, reading it before everybody's had a chance to write it. Uh, and then uh, you uh, so here the, the loops uh, parameters flip. And here, the same J now becomes percent Y, and here it was percent X. So that's, that's the equivalent of how you flip these things, and, uh, and so on. So that's basically a you know, fairly straightforward sort of copy uh, in this, uh, this CUDA language. One thing that's also interesting, you notice that this buffer, I have, my buffer really needs n block times n block data, but I made the leading dimension number one, one bigger. Well, that's an old Cray trick to avoid memory bank conflicts. Because this shared memory has the same kind of memory bank conflicts that the Cray has. So here's another old story <laughs> coming back. And same old trick that uh, you use. You just make this uh, not a power of, say, not a power of two. Make it 65 instead of 64. And most of the bank conflicts disappear. So, uh, so another new idea that's really an old idea. Oh, that's interesting. This my font's changed here. Okay. <laughs> I guess you don't have the font I used on your, on your version of Keynote. Yeah, I have a special font. Uh, okay, so uh, fortunately this is the only equation in my talk. So, <laughs> the, uh, so, so now I'm going to, so what I've been talking about is sort of fairly general. I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about the PIC code that we have and what we've done more, in more detail for the, for the GPU. So, here we, this is kind of a cartoon of, PIC code really has three steps. There's a Poisson equation, uh, you deposit a, a charge density, and then you advance the particles after you solve the, the electric field. This is kind of the easiest one. But so basically there's interpolation. So if a particle is here, then you will deposit, you will distribute its charge to the four nearest grid points. And if the, if the, when you get to the acceleration, the particle is here, you will interpolate the electric field from those four nearest grid points. Uh, and, and the problem with the push, there's no problem, but for the deposit, if there's another thread working on these four points, then they share this grid point in common, and they could be re writing to the same uh, grid at the same time, and, and that's a data hazard. So that's a problem. Uh, so for GPUs, it became clear early on that the, because we have low computational intensity, and, and the ratio of the memory bandwidth, even though it's an order of magnitude higher than me, the, on the main, the, the processors are even faster. It's a teraflop machine. Uh, and so, uh, so the PIC codes really have low computation intensity. They're really memory bound. Uh, and, and the memory is tr traditionally irregular. So that's bad for, for GPUs. So we can Early on, we realized we can, we can really optimize this by if we had a streaming algorithm where we basically, the, the data, the particle data would, in the field data would move in, 
you would process it, move it out, and never read it again. It just was one, one pass through. So, uh, and the only way I could think of to do that is that the particles had to be ordered. So all the particles within one little tile had to be processed at the same time. Okay. And uh, so if that were true, then things would really be easy. You, you uh, minimize global access because the field elements only need to be read once for that whole group of particles. There's no gather scatters except at least not the global memory. You do have them for kind of local fast memory. And these deposits and part and the particles can have an optimal stride line uh, that you need for, for reading the state. But the real challenge was can we actually reorder the particles in any reasonable time frame to make this work? And this took us several years to figure out a good way <laughs> to do that. So we had a lot of kind of uh, things that sort of worked, but eventually we kind of figured we got something that really did work. So we're really pretty, we think we're, we're in good shape now. So the particles then, you divide space into these micro tile, these tiles. In this case, I'm drawing a two, two by three cells in each tile. Uh, and all the particles in that are stored together. Uh, so this is nothing more than domain decomposition from the MPI code, but on a microscopic level, right? Uh, and uh, so that's a familiar concept. We've seen that before. Uh, so the way this thing works is when we uh, at the when we enter when the the code for the tile each tile is done in parallel and independently. So when you pro process a tile, you first copy the field from global memory to fast memory. So there's all, so that. The one and only read for that. When you deposit it, you also write the global memory. When you push, you don't. Uh, all these tiles can be done in parallel. There's some guard cells that aren't in the picture. So basically, for push, it's trivial. It's just very similar to MPI code, except the partitions are, are tiny. For deposit, you have this possible uh, uh, data collision. So. It turns out it's easy if each tile is just controlled by one thread. So it depends on how you assign the threads to what. So if you give one thread to each tile, there's no data hazards and everything works. But if you want to get better performance, then you can uh, use a vector of tiles on one tile, I mean a vector of threads on one tile, and then data collisions are possible. So this only works if the, the system supports atomic update. And atomic update means you're going to treat an update you're going to add one to something, that, and it's not interruptible. Right? It's complete before someone else tries to add one in the middle of, of your thing. So NVIDIA does have atomic updates. Actually, OpenMP has an atomic update command, and, but not everybody does. Uh, so, so the hard one was this particle, maintaining particle order. And uh, so the way we did it was we first create a list of particles that are leaving a tile. Uh, then uh, using the list, each thread places the outgoing particles into an ordered particle buffer, and then uh, there's a synchronization, and then you're reading from that. So let me just draw a picture here. So here's a tile, and there's a bunch of particles going in these eight different directions. Direction one, two, three. So all the ones that are going in one are stored together in this buffer. And uh, the two are stored next to it in this buffer. Uh, and so, there, so this is an ordered buffer. So with the MPI code, we had a left and right buffer. Here we do all of them simultaneously. And so all of these directions are done at once. Not just first, there's not a loop over that. They're done simultaneously. And then when you go read them, everybody knows whoever, this guy needs to get data from eight different directions, but he knows exactly where to go. Uh, to get them, so you don't have to search or anything like that. So this all runs in parallel. All the tiles are running uh, in parallel, and these guys are done in vector mode, so they're all done also simultaneously. Uh, so that's uh, the, that was the hard one. Uh, we've in, in, you know, we, here's some benchmark from this code. We've also implemented an OpenMP. So if you throw away the vectorization and just write a serial version of that. And the blocks become the open MP loops, and you can run it on a traditional optical. So here's the original code. This is a PD. This is the same one I did in 1975, more or less. Uh, bigger problem size, though. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, so it takes about 31 nanoseconds uh, on one core of an I7, 800 picoseconds on, on Spermi. And, and with OpenMP on 12 cores that we have on our Gaussian system, it's about three. So it's almost perfect speed up, actually, with the OpenMP. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, doesn't require extra copies of anything. So only the ed there's only edges. So we get really the speed up. So basically in 16 years, one GPU card is now 15 times the speed of uh, T3E that we had 16 years earlier. Uh, the cost is now 7 times 10 to the minus 8 cents <laughs> and not 30 cents. So it's gone down 9 orders of magnitude. Uh, so that's good news. <laughs> uh, and the GPU card will fit in your desktop. Okay? So this problem, which is 150 million particles are running on one GPU, uh, it is a problem that was similar to the size of the numerical tokamak project we did on that T3E. So the, we had 100 million particles was the biggest that we did. Uh, so now you can do that whole thing on your desktop with one GPU. <laughs> and it runs 30 times better. <laughs> so things are uh, moving along. So uh, this is an electromagnetic uh, case. We have actually better speed up. Uh, this is about, the other one was about 30, 30 times faster from a single. This is about 50. Uh, for that. Uh, I'm going to perhaps skip over the details of this multiple GPU uh, because I'm kind of getting low on time here. But there wasn't much that needed. Basically, there was just, you had to, there was an extra MPI that scraped off the bottom layer of, of the tiles in order to send them to the neighbors. So that was the main, main key. But the, the thing I will show you is this is some. Um, so Adam Tableman, a graduate student in our group, has taken the, the code of OSIRIS, uh, which is our workhorse uh, thick code for uh, laser plasma interactions and plasma accelerators, and he implemented this algorithm. Uh, so the code that I'm testing was actually a skeleton code. So this is a bare bones code that I use for testing and evaluating developing new architectures. So he took those algorithms, put them into OSIRIS, and he's running here now on up to 225 uh, GPUs. And this is a kind of weak scaling, and it's very, very good. I mean, it's, it's almost perfect weak scaling uh, across these, uh, these GPUs. So this problem here that he's running is uh, got 22 billion particles. This is on our Dawson cluster. It, it has like 300 GPUs. So 22 billion particles, and it takes about 10th of a second to update the 22 billion particles. And it's uh, on a fairly small system. <laughs> That is, well, not that small, but you know, reasonably small. So now doing hard, strong scaling on GPUs is very problematical because GPU has, you know, 500,000 cores. And you've got to keep them all busy or it's worthless, right? So when you do strong scaling, you're reducing the problem size. And it doesn't take long before it's just way too weak for the GPU to do anything with it because you can't keep the threads all busy. So it, it's hard to do strong scale. You're really kind of pushed into you know, really doing uh, weak scaling. And, and so your problem size determines really how many GPUs you're going to use. So, um, so one last thing I want to talk about is that UCLA has recently been funded to, to create a particle and cell and kinetic simulation software center. Uh, the goal is to provide and document parallel PIC codes uh, and uh, make them open source. So I, I do not have a time to really go through the activities that this center is funded to provide. But the, the key thing is that components and codes, both skeleton codes and otherwise, will be uh, available through open source licenses. And uh, it's intended to be a community resource for PIC for, for anybody. And we welcome contributions from others uh, for this activity. Uh, I will show you, we, this is just getting going. We don't actually have a website yet. Uh, but we do have a, a website that has some of these skeleton codes. So these have been available for a few months now. So these are intended to be teaching codes, and they're intended to teach people what a PIC code is. And they're also intended to uh, teach people how to parallelize PIC codes with different algorithms. So some of the customers are students and researchers, but the others are also computer scientists who are evaluating, say, compilers or things like that. And, and they want a, a non-trivial application uh, for them. So we have, a, so we, we have a, right now, we have electrostatic, electromagnetic uh, spectral codes. We expect to have other codes. There'll be finite difference codes. There'll be probably gyrokinetic codes in here 
and others. We have some codes that are uh, have one level of parallelism. So these are kind of the traditional codes we're used to using. This is with OpenMP. This is with MPI. And then we have a, a new family with two levels of parallelism. Uh, so, this so this includes the GPU code, but also a hybrid OpenMP and MPI code. And there'll be three levels of parallelism coming. We're interested in other languages and collaborating with people. For example, how are you going to express three levels of parallelism? Is there a language out there that can do that? We'd be interested to collaborate with people uh, to uh, look, look at, the, at those issues. So these, all the codes I talked about today, except for Osiris, are available here on the website. You can download them. This uh, CUDA code is actually CUDA C, and CUDA Fortran will be there probably in a week or two. So, so if you're a Fortran person, don't despair. <laughs> And uh, so this the conclusion then is uh, that PIC algorithms on emerging architectures are largely a combination of previous techniques, but not entirely. Uh, so that includes vector techniques, blocking, uh, tiling, uh, message passing. One thing I didn't mention too much is uh, data parallel techniques. This is basically vectorization with uh, array syntax. There wasn't much history at NERSC with this, but I used this on... on on like the thinking machines, the connection machine, they had uh, that well developed. HPF Fortran also had that kind of stuff. So those are actually fairly useful and I use uh, some of those kinds of techniques as well, which I didn't talk about too much. Uh, so programming for this hardware abstraction leads to common algorithms. So we have, you know, an OpenMP version that works with traditional architectures. Uh, by the way, that OpenMP version also keeps particles ordered. So one of the things in PIC codes we sometimes want is to add additional operators, like collision operators. And to do that has been expensive because you had to find where your neighbors are. Well, now it's free. The neighbors are there. You know where they are because everything is in these microtunnels. So further information, uh, there's a paper that discusses this thing that just came out actually yes, day before yesterday. And there's a website that, that has some information as, as well. And there will be a Pick center website, hopefully, in the next week or two. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. So, that, that's very interesting. Do you have questions for Victor? I'm just curious how you, how you set up the initial conditions for these particle and cell codes. Do you assume the particles are just there? Or are they coming in from the outside, or how does that work? You mean at the very beginning of the code? It's a very, it's a yeah, very so what we do is well, the, the, the code is initialized on the host. And so then we just have a, a, a routine that goes and uh, checks uh, each particle one by one to see uh, which tile it belongs to and just leaves them there at the So that's not, but that's only done once at t equals zero. So. Is that what you're talking about? Well, I, I just wondered how do you decide how to start it? I mean, do you start like with uniform particles? Then? Oh, yeah, for this, for, well, yeah, so that, that's a physics question, right? Okay. right? Yeah, yeah. So this these skeleton codes, they're just uniform, right? But the OSIRIS code has different ways of doing non-uniformity. The way, the way I do it, personally, is uh, I actually do a root finding scheme. I have, I have a distribution function, and I, I, I look for the roots of where I integrate the particle until I get an integer, <laughs> you know, because the way I normalize density. So, so the, the total integral is the total number of particles, so whenever I get one, that's where the particle uh, and so, but the, the, uh, Cyrus has a different way. They actually weight the, the charge kind of inversely to, to the density. So it, 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 that's a different way of doing it. So, so, so there you just, do, you just do an integral. But that's all part of the initialization. So none of that we do on the GPU. So that's all done uh, up front. So um, you, you put a lot of work into, uh, with your skeleton code, as you described it. And then you took the results of that, or semi took it, and, and yeah. integrated it into Osiris. So, right. Would you characterize the amount of work needed to to uh, put, to bring Osiris um, into these architectures as um, easy, difficult, major, minor? Uh, well, I think medium. I mean, Adam also added some additional optimizations that I didn't have because he's really kind of gung ho about this stuff. <laughs> so I mean, he he went and read through the assembly language app, but he really got into it. But but uh, in general, the, the hard one was the sorter, the reorder. So you can use that as a black box. I don't think you need to know how it works, right? And then the push and the deposit, 
are pretty straightforward because they're largely the same old code except there's another layer where there's an outer loop over tiles and an inner loop over the number of particles in the tile and there's a temporary copy to a local array. Otherwise, it's the same algorithm. So I would say, you know, for at least on one GPU, it, it, it should be fair, fairly straightforward. And on my website, I have a little kind of diff program that shows you what things I changed to go from, you know, one version to another so you could look at it. So I, I hope that it's not, but you know, there, there are little details that are kind of annoying that on the GPU, every thing that's a subroutine, it becomes two subroutines because there's a host subroutine that launches the kernel and what, what was inside your loop is now on a different place. So there's kind of these annoying things that, that are, uh, you have to kind of worry about. So it, it'll take a while, but I think there's, uh, Neither the push nor the deposit have anything terribly difficult. Uh, I mean, there's some new things. You have atomic updates, but that's just a subroutine call. And so, on. so I hope the hard one was the reordering, and I hope you never have to look at that. <laughs> However, jar kinetics is a different matter. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. What's that? <laughs> uh, my question is: uh, You've done all that work with CUDA. How, what do you think about the, uh, you know, OpenMP like OpenACC? I mean, do you think they're going to be mature enough that, you know, you could be? Yeah, they're not that? there certainly now. And, uh, and if you, Frank Sung actually is he there? Yes, he is. So he's been he's been actually playing with with uh, the OpenACC. It, it just looks like they don't support everything that you can control with it. It's kind of immature. Uh, would you say that's fair? Right. So So Victor has a list of codes that's available. And one of them is the OpenMP version of it. So I took that and tried to port it to OpenACC, which is, which is a trivial task because many of the directives are the same. But once, you, once you've done that. So he's talking about these codes here. Right. Once you've done that and you use the compiler, the compiler is going to tell you, I can do it. But then at that point, you're stuck because it doesn't give you provide hints as to how one, how to get it so the compiler understands what you're tr trying to accomplish and trying to optimize it for the GPU. I mean, um, but if I it doesn't work, you don't know what to do. Work. Right. If it doesn't work, <laughs> you don't know what to do because there is no next step and the, comp the compiler is not very good about it. And so you're trying to use the compiler as an intermediary between you and the hardware and that I don't know, I don't know how to get there. But I also heard from other people at like APS meetings, like one guy at Princeton, who, that, that, that the OpenACC is just doesn't support things that CUDA does. It's just not there yet. We did try using an OpenMP on the Intel Pi to see how that worked. And the parallelization part uh, it worked great. Uh, it didn't vectorize anything out of the box. So clearly we need to, that seems to be the thing to work on for a Pi. But, so if you think the structure of the code is correct, it will work on the fly. The parallel part does work. The vectorization does nothing. Uh, so at the, at the moment. But we, I mean, we know it vectorizes because the CUDA has vectorized it. So we we'll know it's possible. The question for the MERC users is by the time the thing is Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Don't know. Yeah. But also, a part of my thing is I'm agnostic. I don't care if I wins or CUDA wins. I think this structure for this abstract machine will win. <laughs> I don't really care who the winner is in terms of the actual vendor. I think we can make it work, right? Because I think they're all going to be like that. You can see that the SIMD units have to be there because of energy. I mean, it's just inevitable that they're going to look something like that. I just don't know exactly. And the languages are catching up. I mean, I, they're not there yet. I mean, we. With MPI, we really need three levels of parallelism, right? So is that going to be done with Coarray Fortran with some extra stuff, or do we still have to use MPI? I mean, that's all an evolving thing and, 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 uh, and you know, moving target. I think the abstractions of how you do two levels of parallelism is still not totally there. Uh, it's, it's new. People haven't been doing that for a long time. So you kind of have a flaw on the amount of parallelism 
you kind of have a flaw on the amount of parallelism you can exploit with this sorting algorithm, which is just the number of grid points. Can you physic? Can, does the physics justify just increasing the number of grid points if you end up with more, the need for more, uh, sorry, if you end up with more hardware cores than grid points? You mean, you mean the size points? of the tile? You're talking right, about? exactly. Yeah, the size of the tile is clearly arbitrary, right? And so we, we just actually, when I did those measurements, I just scanned through and found the, the one that was out there. There's actually two competing things going on on GPUs. One is that the bigger the tiles, the more shared memory you, you need. Now, the GPUs are trying to run multiple independent blocks simultaneously. So they call this occupancy. So the bigger the shared memory you request, the smaller the occupancy that you have. On the other hand, the, 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 the bigger the tile is, the faster the sorter goes because very few particles leave. So the reordering is very fast. So, so there's typically a peak somewhere in there where, you, you know, your occupancy goes down uh, and, but, but, you know, so right now it's typically 16 by 16 is what we're using most of the time, uh, but it probably wiggles a bit. If you're using one thread per, per tile like we did on, on the not pre-Fermi architecture, then the, the, the tiles are more like two by three because only one thread is responsible for tiling. You quickly run out of shared memory. So, uh, but we can do a co completely collision-free algorithm if, if necessary. Fortunately, the hardwares are now being able to kind of resolve collisions fairly well. Uh, but, you know, some future architecture might not, so we're ready. <laughs> well, 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 thank you, Victor. Lots of good questions, and you'll be around um, for individual discussions if anyone would like the rest of the yep. day. So, thank you again. Thank you.